Hi, I'm Michael Fitzgerald. I'm a contributing editor at MIT Sloan Management Review. Welcome to our latest look at how large traditional companies are engaging in digital transformation. Today I'm talking with executives from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, the $1.3 billion publisher of trade books and K-12 educational content. To my right are Linda Zecker, the CEO and president of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and to her right is Mary Cullinane, the company's new chief content officer. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt is a famous name in trade publishing, but we're here today to talk about its dominant business, which we know as textbooks. The $6.3 billion market for K-12 textbooks is undergoing dramatic change, although not at the same rate as the market for university textbooks. K-12 school districts run a vast gamut in size, in income levels of the families whose children attend them or the communities that fund them, and in access to technology. They also face significant constraints. What they teach must map to state and national standards. So transformation in this industry is not something that a company can just dictate on its own. I say these things as context for this discussion. Linda, Mary, thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Linda, I want to start with you. You joined Houghton Mifflin Harcourt from uh, a technology company, Microsoft, <laughs> in September 2011, about a year and a half ago. When you came in, what were you thinking you were going to need to do uh, in, this, in this industry? What I didn't realize until I became CEO of Houghton Mifflin was that um, we were really in this transformation of trying to leverage technology, but we didn't really, we were, the industry is moving at a very different pace depending upon the school district, et cetera. So I had to really kind of step back and think about, it's just not about technology, it's about the blending of technology and great content. And this is not something where you just go in and throw technology at a problem, you have to think about it as a holistic solution. When you joined Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, it was a company that had sort of a legacy of some bad management decisions behind it. Uh, a lot of debt had been piled up. You also had to deal with uh, sort of operational transformation. Which did you have to address first? Well, I sort of dealt with them all at the same time. I mean, there's sort of three you know, legs to the stool. And getting our balance sheet cleaned up and getting our fiscal house in order so that we could you know, you know, put money into the areas that we really wanted to develop, that was a key component of this. The second thing was really bringing in a, t you know, a top tier management team that could really help us manage the business and make sure that we had the right people in place so that once we did clean up the company, we had the people that could take the leadership role and move the company forward. And then the third component was really making sure that we had great content. We have a wonderful brand and we're well known in the school districts and we have incredible market share. So being able to then take that and leverage it and take it to the next tier and, and how we were going to transform education through that rich content with technology. We're in an industry, uh, well, we're in a culture, really, where there's a kind of techno-determinism. We, we believe that... <laughs> I love uh, that word. That's a good one. <laughs> we, we believe that technology can fix all problems. Uh, what's the reality for the education market? Depending on where you're at in the country, but it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of investors that invest in the company, and many of them are, you know, are in New York and on the East Coast. And so their children are going to very high-end education schools, and... And so there tends to be this mentality in these very high-end schools that if you throw an iPad at a child, they're going to learn Russian. And that's just not the case. I mean, there's a lot more to the process of learning. And when you think about it from grades like kindergarten or even preschool through like fourth grade, you're really learning how to learn. You're learning the fundamentals. You're learning how to read. You're learning how to write. You're learning how to spell. You're learning all the fundamentals and basic math. From beyond that, you're really becoming educated. And so when you get outside of, of some of these really high-end schools that can afford the very top technology and the great support systems that are there, you realize that the rest of the country doesn't even have the technology infrastructure in the schools to re even manage technology. And then you don't have teachers and content that is really geared around technology. So when you look at the technologies that you can bring to bear to try to help with learning, uh, in, in, in a formal school environment, what are the ones that you feel are, are, have the most potential to, to, in fact, change education? Part of the challenge is many people think about the problem that way. And what we would like to see more of is people thinking about, here's the process that we go through in teaching and learning. Here's recognition of prior knowledge. Here's collaboration. Here's reinforcement. Here's assessment. And then when you look at those steps in the learning process, where does technology play and what type of te technology can play a piece in making that element of the process more efficient, more effective, um, allow all kids to have a, a more personalized experience? What we see in classrooms a lot are that they start with the technology. 
they get the whiteboard and then they put it in the classroom and they say, okay, now what are we going to do with it? They get the laptop and they put it in the classroom. They get the iPad, they put it into the classroom. And then they try, they try to reverse engineer. And what we're trying to do is take a step back and look at the elements of the learning process and then figure out what technology, whatever it may be, whatever it needs to be, will enhance or, or increase the effectiveness of that component. So how are you doing that? Well, you know, if you look at things like game theory, yeah. um, that, that's a great opportunity for us. And again, we, it, starts, it starts to get a little noisy in the marketplace because folks feel like it's all about gamification. You hear that word all the time. The real, the real excitement around gamification should be game theory. Uh, when you play Angry Birds, which I'm assuming you dabbled in a little bit. Uh, guilty. Um, you know, the first two levels you will do well in. And there's a theory behind that because they want you to have a positive experience in that challenge. And when you have a positive experience in a challenge, you're more likely to come back. Uh, we know that kids today, when they're playing games, are failing about 80% of the time in that experience. These are educational games. Games in general. And what do they keep doing? Coming back because they've created an environment where they, they recognize if I keep doing this, I'm going to have an opportunity for success. And yet we haven't created that environment in our classrooms. So when we think about the power of gaming, we should think about the game theory that's behind it and how do we take those lessons and apply it to the teaching and learning process as opposed to let's just gamify everything and throw it in front of our kids. So can you give an example of how you are managing that process and, and trying to bring more effective use of, of gaming techniques into the education process? Well, one of the things that we did, we just acquired a company called Tribal Nova. And they've already been doing a lot with PBS Kids and they've created um, a lot of different games using characters around the whole idea of pre-K learning and gamification. And so we've been working with them and then we acquired them. And one of the things that we're looking at is taking many of our iconic brands that we have on the trade side of the house, like Curious George, uh, Gossy and Gertie, Little Blue Truck, things like that, and really trying to figure out is there a way that we can take them and meld them in with the learning experience around math or reading to make this more fun but make it something that the kids can engage in by themselves and or with their parents or teachers but in a way that makes it fun for them so they want to continue to go to the next level. We've done, we have 34 apps today that we have out on the iPad or the iPhone. Not all the same experience, some are better than others. But as we move forward, we're trying to do more and more of this, and we're experimenting with those types of things. Another thing that we're doing is that we have a math pro uh, program called Go Math. And so we've taken the Go Math program. We went out and we got some puppeteers, very similar to the Sesame Street types of puppets. And we're actually using those in creating lessons. So it would be a lesson on maybe a geometry theory, or it might be a lesson on just a basic math theory or something else. But it's with a professor and with a puppet and making it a fun kind of learning thing so the children can go back and not just learn in the classroom, but then maybe go back and review that in a fun kind of environment. Just like Kukla, Fran, and Ollie meet exactly. Khan Academy. Yeah. And exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. So but all of that tied to Common Core and tied to the pedagogy of the curriculum exactly. that's necessary for the learning experience. And that's the big difference between us and just someone coming out with the game. Because if you just come out with the game, it's not tied to anything else that the kids are learning. If you tie it in with what they're doing in the classroom and what they need to do around Common Core and what needs to be done at various different stages of learning, and then you have a better chance of really having that individualized experience that Mary was talking about. And so when, when this plays out, I mean, you're not, uh, you, there are obviously programs that I can download uh, or go to the web, uh, have my kids download and go to the web on, but you're talking about integrating this in with a classroom experience, correct? So how, how does that work? Take one of these 34 apps and, and show us how that would play out in a, in a classroom. You know, you start to see the way that instruction is being delivered to change a little bit, in which um, when we probably all were in classrooms, there was a teacher in front of the class and folks were in rows and we all turned the page at the same time. And now what we're starting to see more of is teachers trying to figure out, given the great differential of aptitude within their classrooms, how do they address the individual needs of those kids? So in some, you know, you start to see more pods being created. You start to see more individualized instruction. You start to see, you know, greater elasticity to the type of pedagogy that teachers are using in their classrooms. So you'll have some kids over here where the appropriate tool for them with their need right then and there is, is a game. Could have three iPads in the classroom and those three kids are on something. Over here, you'll have kids who are being remediated with a teacher instruction. So a teacher sitting with them and going over. Over there in the back, you might have three kids who are doing great working on their own right now. And so what we're trying to do is bring that 
ability to adapt our instruction, adapt content, adapt the way it's being distributed for what's best for that kid. And the thing I worry about is, you know, sometimes in the industry we think that every problem can be solved by one solution. And I guarantee you, when you're in a classroom and you have 36 kids in front of you, every single one of them is going to learn differently. And there's not going to be one trick that you're going to be able to pull out of your bag that's going to address all those needs. And we have to remember that in the solutions and the resources and the tools that we bring to bear, or else we're going to leave kids behind. You know, another point on that is in the early 70s, there was this entire push towards open classrooms. Yep. And everyone was going <laughs> to an open classroom. The problem with the open classroom, one of the reasons that it failed in so many cases, was that they just thought they were going to have an open classroom and they'd give all these kids their own book and everyone could go off and learn on their own. There was going to be all this individualized learning. What they didn't put behind that was the individualized instruction materials. They didn't put behind that the teacher development or professional development that was needed in order to know how to manage a classroom like that. And they didn't have any of the tools that were necessary for the various different degrees that, that children were at. Some are very quick, some are not, some need inter, you know, uh, remediation, some need you know, other things. And so they didn't really have any of that stuff around it. So it's almost like we've gone full circle to where we know that individualized instruction is a great way for kids to learn, and it works. But it doesn't work if you don't have the proper tools and the, and the proper teacher support to be able to make it work effectively. Are you foreseeing an educational environment where the assumption is that the kid is going to have a device of some sort that is in the classroom that they are going to use to, to, to be educated, to complement what the teacher is doing, as opposed to you know having the teacher take the device away when they walk in the door, which is what happens I think it's now. a given they're going to have a device. Yeah. I think that's a given. And I don't think that if you're in this marketplace and you think that's not the direction that the industry is going, I think you have your head in the sand. So that's definitely a given. And I think that a lot of it's going to be mobile. And as you get outside the U.S., mobile is probably a little faster than you're seeing in the U.S. It's just trying to, you know, back to what Mary said, trying to make sure that you optimize for that particular device to make sure that you've got it set in a way that they can really get the richest experiences that they can. Where we have seen the space lag a little bit is the types of devices that they're bringing in and using or the devices that are being provided to them. So outside in the consumer space, you probably see more hits to a website right now coming from a smartphone, where if you look at our website, more hits are coming to our website off of a laptop. So the reality, though, is that right now, for instance, if my seventh grader and my fifth grader bring their cell phone to school, they don't come out in the classroom. The teachers don't want them there. Students in general are going to be more interested in something other than uh, the curriculum. I mean, they're going to pull those things out and look at them when they're bored, right? Yeah, right? So are you working with school districts on how to manage the, the boredom factor, the, the multi-purpose nature of the devices we're discussing? Well, that's where one of the biggest challenges is, and that's why we sometimes push back that technology is going to solve all the problems. Because, you know, you, if you're thinking about a first grade class or a second grade class, can you imagine 30 kids in the classroom all trying to have a device in front of them and trying to manage what they're doing? One breaks down, this one doesn't work, this one can't find the page, you know, all those kinds of things. And so you're going to spend all of your teaching time trying to solve a problem rather than really, you know, instructing. And so this is the challenge that teachers are facing. And so there's a lot of professional development and things like that around how they can better manage that. But we're not there yet. I mean, it's, it's definitely a challenge. And at the same time, you know, even without technology, you will always have the case in a classroom where kids are bored. You have one kid that's learning at one level and another kid that's learning at another, and one's, you know, playing with their pencils and the other one's, you know, trying to read the book. And that's really where you can leverage technology around this individualized instruction so that as one kid gets bored, you can maybe challenge them with something that's a little bit more difficult or bring in a game or something like that that they could potentially use to get more engaged whereas the other child has a different experience with a different kind of individualized instruction. The teacher has a little uh, dashboard in effect on, on his or her desk or monitor where he, can, he or she can sort of see what's going on with the students and check in. Is that you know, where we're some, heading? In some school yeah. systems today, you have kids who one are one-to-one -one and they all have a device and that teacher has, literally, has that dashboard that you're referencing and there's technology out there that they can actually shut down an application that's on a device that they see. You know, that's out there. We have school systems in which kids are bringing their phones into the schools and they're taking them out to answer quiz. So uh, a teacher will put a question up on a screen and there's a software program that they can then actually text the answer to and you'll see a graph come up to say how many chose A, how many chose B, how many chose C. So all that stuff's in there. 
But at the end of the day, it goes back to the instruction. And it goes back to whether or not the pedagogy is there, the instructional quality is there. And these things sometimes, I think, just become a little bit of a distraction in the debate. Um, teachers have always, throughout their careers, throughout history, have looked for ways in which they can engage their students. Yeah. And now they're looking for different tools to help make that happen. Uh, I don't think that story's changed at all. So, and I don't want to go too far afield, it's not like you make devices at, at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. You produce content. How does technology affect the way that you create and deliver content in, in a business that is still predominantly a print-based business, yeah? You know, the way that we're thinking about content is, to your point, there has to be that flexibility. So that's kind of a design pillar for us. We have to ensure that the quality, that the pedagogy can be represented, represented in a textbook as well as on a device. So there's that requirement in our design process. Again, we also want to take advantage of the technology. So how do we start to develop kind of at the platform layer these features and functionality that take advantage of the fact that the kid does have a device, that they have access to storage on the cloud, that they have the ability to um, interact with their teacher, that they have the ability to dive deeper into a piece of content that they see when they double click on it. So we have to think differently about ensuring that we're, we're providing that content in a rich way if it has to be delivered in print, but that we're taking advantage and adding some tools and features and functionality. And then the third piece that is incredibly exciting and I think we're starting to see more through partnerships is how do we start to really deliver on what everybody's talking about with adaptive learning. Right. So in a digital context, when I get a sense of where the kid's going, how can I change that kid's instructional direction based upon their acumen? If they do really well, I want to give them something harder. If they don't do so well, I want to be able to remediate them. Um, and a technical environment gathers that data and is then able to point them into a learning direction um, by, by recognizing certain content that's tagged a certain way and then exposing that to the learner. So that's developing a very different environment than what the print would allow for. So talk to us about uh, adaptive learning and, and uh, what the, what's enabling it, uh, what the obstacles are to it in the market. Well, I think the, the first thing about adaptive learning is that you've got to have a platform that can allow you to have all of this different content drawn from various different places and presented in different ways. So the tagging elements and all the, the background work that has to be done to make that available is a key component. Once you have all of that done, the best part about adaptive learning is that you, you really do have then the ability to serve up you know, whatever type of content is necessary based on what that child is in the learning experience. And so if you have a teacher and that is really working across various different levels of children, she then has the ability or he has the ability to pull that content in. So an adaptive learning is no more than if you have a child that's you know, a, a you know, top student, you give them extracurricular activities or you give them additional things to read or you send them home with new books. If you have a child that's having problems, you put them in a tutorial and you give them you know, maybe a, a tutoring class or additional homework or things like that. It's the same type of thing, but it's being served up very individualized and it's being served up immediately so that you can keep that child engaged and keep them moving along on their continuum. We're really seeing it in its infancy right now. I mean, adaptive learning, we'll get to a point where we can adapt on multiple levels or multiple pivots. We should be able to adapt based upon your preferences. Yeah. If you're really into golf and you have to read a story, why not serve up a golf story? Um, if you're really into skateboards and you have to read a paragraph, why not serve up quickly a skateboard story? So that you're going to be able to take advantage of that child's interest and now they're going to be more engaged. Um, we have to be able to adapt on acumen. If you're a fast reader, if you're a slow reader, be able to pivot on that. And then we also have to be able to adapt on learning style. Maybe you would be better off in an online environment or you would be better off in a, in a manipulative environment or you'd be better off hearing something or you'd be better off reading something. So there's all these different pivots that we need to get to and we're not there. How are you structuring your organization to be able to move towards this adaptive learning environment? Well, before we did everything from a print perspective and then we had a digital component. <laughs> and now we're doing everything from a digital component and print becomes a distribution vehicle. So in the old days, if a school wanted to adapt uh, their textbook, maybe in their math continuum they wanted to teach Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, another school might want to teach some Algebra 2 concepts with Algebra 1, whatever, you would have to then go back, you'd realign the chapters, you'd go back, you'd print, you'd create a new book, you'd do all these additional things. 
Now we can say, okay, you'd like to have, here's A through Z, you want A, B, and D this time, or you want A, B, and F this time, no problem. It's a very, you, know, you take a content management system, you pull the components out, and you just redistribute them in a new way. And you can do that on the fly based on the needs of that classroom or that student, et cetera. So, so when we think about how we're developing, we're developing everything in the idea of having a learning object or everything as a widget so that you can pull it in in various different ways very quickly to make this collective content um, and it, that flows in a pedagogically sound way. I know you're using analytics to try to do a better job of creating adaptive uh, curricular content. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you in the process of, of this adaptive learning curriculum and where do you need to get to? You know, I think right now the industry is very much at its, at its infancy. I think we're partnering right now with some great folks who have built some solid analytic uh, engines and data cubes around that process. And we're starting to take advantage of things like the cloud and big data and all that, that stuff that folks are talking about. Um, you have a couple of challenges. One, for those environments to truly work, you need to have pervasive devices throughout school systems um, to really get the benefit of that, of that opportunity. We're not quite there yet. Two, the, the amount of data that, or data points that you're able to pull that allow you to point the kid in the next direction, the end needs to be a little bit bigger there. Uh, you know, we just don't have the, the number of examples or the number of data points that will get us to where we can truly start to see some strong things that the correlations are high enough that we can build off of, but we're getting there. And then three, when you really have a truly adaptive environment, you need a ton of tag content. Because now, instead of everybody just turning the page to the other page that you know is right. going to be there, you need a ton of content that regardless of where that kid needs to go, you have something that's of quality and is tagged and ready to be there. Yep. And so we're continuing to push that out. This is going to be a journey. It's going to take folks a little bit of time. But I think recognition of it is half the problem. Um, I think we have the systems in place, um, and I think we have the right people thinking about it. So how are you as a company trying to address the, the personalization aspect of it? Well, it goes back to that infrastructure, to that platform that we're building out. So it goes back to that when we produce our content now, we tag it at a much more granular level. So we give it attributes that recognize the content unit as opposed to the book or program. So we're able to start pulling off of that. Um, and then we're building that analytic structure on top of it, a place for when a kid clicks here or answers this question this way, we gather that data and are able to learn from it. That takes investment and that takes a little bit of time. A great example of that is some of the things that are happening in online tutorials with kids and, and having them you know, in their homework assignments and things like that. Is a teacher being able to understand when she looks at her dashboard or she looks at the analytics that come out of the assignments, how long did it take them to solve the problem? Yeah. How many times did they click on help? How many times did they go back? You know, how quickly did they get the first, you know, the right answer? And so those kinds of things are helpful to the teacher to then go back and be able to say, okay, maybe we need to change how your homework is structured, or maybe we need to change how you're getting this lesson presented in class. And so that's different than just online or, or you know, individualized instruction. That really is adapting the courseware and adapting your environment to help you move forward. How has your hiring changed to produce this? Well, Mary's an example of that. I'm an example of that. I mean, the entire management team is, is pretty much, except for a, a few exceptions, pretty much out of the technology environment. And we've brought a lot of new people into um, the environment in the development group that mm -hmm. have uh, gamification knowledge, that have technology knowledge, that different have design knowledge. different design knowledge. And then we've also brought a lot of people across the board you know, on the sales side that know how to talk about technology and know how to really present this to the classroom so they can understand what this is. Because remember, you're selling to teachers and you're selling to superintendents, many of which their only experience with technology is what they do on their own laptop at home. They don't really have a technology background. And so the idea of going in front of 30 kids in a classroom and having to meet all these standards that the government's being you know, putting in place and being measured on that and then having to do it in an environment that you are completely uncomfortable is really hard. So there's a, you know, a lot of process here. I know that you've shifted the organizational structure so that you, you've now got subject matter experts who work with print and digital instructional designers. Uh, you know, how is this working and are you able to find the skills you need for these, these designers? Yeah, you know, we're really starting to change the way that we think about the org and even little things like look, the titles that they're starting to have. You know, learning architects, that's a different title than an editor. 
um, and it seems... Is it the same job? It's a different job with the same, hoping, hopefully with the same outcome, the production of quality content. And, and, but we have to think about it differently with regards to what, what tools do I have to consider when I'm producing that content. Before, you had a page, you know, and you had to get so many words on that page and you, know, you knew how many graphs you were going to put on that page and you knew how many paragraphs you were going to put on that page. Now, you, you're not, there are no page numbers. There are no page numbers on this other side. And when you start to have that type of freedom, um, you have to think differently about design. You have to think differently about the user experience. And what we're really trying to focus on at HMH is having a consistent HMH experience, as opposed to an experience in math, an experience in English, an experience in reading. Um, we want to we create that continuum. We want to create that brand across all disciplines that takes advantage of technology, that takes advantage of feature, that takes advantage of platform, and not just focus on one specific discipline in our innovation. Do you feel like you've got a pretty good handle on managing the technology to help enable the change you want, or is the technology still something you're trying to get your arms around? Well, I think we're in transition. I mean, yeah. like everybody else, we're in transition. And you know, as a team, we've only been there about 18 months, and so there's a lot we have to do. And I don't think we have all the answers by any stretch. And we're obviously, you know, technology is changing and how you use it in the classroom. And so we're trying to stay ahead of the curve, but we're definitely not there. I mean, we're in this journey also. And so I think that we have the, some good ideas and I think we have a good process in place. And I think we're on a very good journey of, of really contributing to where we think we should be from a technology standpoint, but we're not there yet. And we have a lot that we could probably learn and, and add to. And the, you know, the adoption cycles in this environment are much different. They're much faster. It's so the, the, the length of time that it took Facebook to get to 150 million users compared to the length of time that it took color televisions to, yeah. to populate our, our environment at 150 million was drastically different. And so now we have, this, we have this reality where we have different technologies that are being adapted so much into the norm of our experience, and the education system just can't react that quickly. And so there's always going to be that natural tension there that I think we have to recognize and respect and ensure that we don't, we don't move too fast um, but we take advantage of, of what the kids are using and what the norms are, um, recognizing that that space isn't going to move as fast as, as some others. How much leeway do you have in a country where we teach to the test? It's a challenge, you know. And Very I, challenging. And I, I think you start to see a mindset, and an appropriate one. You know, I, as a teacher, I used, to, I used to see that test and that yardstick as kind of secondary. I knew that if I created a great learning environment and the kids had a great experience and I, I addressed the content, the test was going to play out. Now, they were going to they were going to do okay there, um, and so the teach to the test mentality. Yes, you do have some in the classroom who want to know exactly what they're going to be tested on, and they address their instruction based upon that. But then there is the opportunity at the macro level to say, if I provide a great learning environment and great content, the kids will do well on the test. And I think coming from a technology environment, we really respect and understand technology, and we actually love it. And we yeah. think it's great. We always have the newest devices, and we're always playing with the newest things. But we also understand that even in the environment we came from, that when we were talking to our customers, it was about leveraging the technology to solve a problem and a solution. It wasn't about the technology itself. So when you are engaging with school districts or, or even with individual teachers, uh, they have developed techniques for education, yeah. uh, educating kids. Uh, this sounds like you're talking about something that's relatively dramatic change for them. How do you help them adapt? How much pushback do you get? This is not going to be an on-off switch. I mean, this is a <laughs> dimmer. And I say that all the time because, you know, not all schools, not all teachers are going to be prepared to make these kinds of transitions where the industry is going. At the same time, they're all very interested in trying new things and trying to figure out how they can enhance the learning experience. How influential or, or uh, well, how nervous does something like Khan Academy make uh, a, a content publisher. Well, I, think, I think Khan Academy has, you know, they have their place and I think they're, they're great and I think that if they can be utilized in the learning experience, great. The difference between Khan Academy and us is that we can take the same content that we're using in the classroom and we can provide it online with online instruction like the math and focus uh, videos I was talking about. So we can do the same thing and we're also moving into online courseware and, and, and other things like that. So what we try to do is make sure that we can interoperate and try to make sure that whatever we're providing, that if you want to add enrichment to that, that we make that available and we develop our content in a way that you can add that in. Yeah, I mean, the problem, the challenges that we're facing in this country with regards to education and the quality of it are pretty big. Yeah. 
and we as a country should want to bring out every trick, every tool, every resource that we can yeah. to improve upon that. And if Khan Academy is a solution for some educators in their classrooms, great, great. But we recognize that at the end of the day, what we are able to provide, the type of quality, the type of pedagogy, is something that teachers trust, something that superintendents trust, something that parents trust, and we, we're proud of that. And so, so one of the, the big issues in American education, one of the reasons why we have a crisis, is that we, we have a seeming inability to, to um, educate in districts that have large numbers of, of poor people, in effect. Uh, and spending hasn't fixed this. Technology hasn't fixed this. You're doing some work in a working class community, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about the signs of, kinds of things you're doing there and is it relevant to some of these broader social issues? You have to take a step back and recognize that what we're trying to do in these environments, the challenges that we're trying to address, go way beyond technology. And so the work that we're doing in Bridgeport is trying to increase engagement, try to provide access to great quality content for their educators, provide professional development services. But we have to start thinking about community of learners. Um, and it's going to take an entire community to help the challenges of a Bridgeport or yeah. Philadelphia, New York City, or in L.A. You go across this country and you visit a lot of schools, which we do all the time, yeah. and the gap is huge. It's just huge. And we, we have focused so much of our attention on, on being critical of teachers and saying that this is a bad teacher or this is a bad school, when many times the learning environment is just so difficult. Yeah, we, we visited a school in New York City, the Avenue School, which is one of the, the top <laughs> schools. And they have flat screen TVs everywhere. They have pipes coming into the school that are bigger than most corporations have. They have a, you know, an IT staff, I think, of 12 people. They have, you know, they have incredible tools at their disposal. Even in the lunchroom, they have you know, food stations for different kinds of, of ethnic you know, foods. <laughs> and there's all kinds of diversity. It's an incredible learning experience. If you would go into that school and you can't learn in that environment, you know, you're just not going to learn anywhere. It's an amazing environment. Now you go right down the street and to a few other places in New York City and you find a school where you don't even really want to go into the bathrooms. They're just, the learning environment is dirty. They don't have, you know, nothing is new, nothing is fresh, and everything is, is crowded. It's just, it's not a fun environment. Even the playground area is an area that just looks like it's concrete, it's just not an environment where you want to send your child. And so how those two children are going to learn is going to be a completely different experience. But the interesting thing that has come out of all of our, our learnings around this is that even if you went to the Avenue School, they would tell you that you're not going to get a better educational experience there. You're going to get a better environmental experience, but you're not going to get better instruction. You're not necessarily going to get better teachers than what you have down the street, but what you are going to get is better opportunity because it's an environment that's safer, an environment mm -hmm. that has more content, an environment that has more tools. And so the quality of the teacher is so important. And back to your, you know, your question earlier about how we develop, you know, and, and are we selling technology you know, and a lot of digital content. We can offer you an all digital program, we can offer you a blended program, we can offer you just a print program. Most schools will take blended, but they'll still use only print. And they'll do that because they simply don't have the tools in place. They want to try, but the tools aren't there. So the problem this country has is, and, and where school boards, et cetera, get really concerned and say, we need more technology in the classroom. What they really need is more infrastructure in the classroom because the technology without the infrastructures to support it is just a device. And so, and the teacher in the classroom without the professional development on how to leverage that device is just a teacher standing in front of a classroom of kids using an iPad. And so it's a holistic approach that we really have to think about. It's not just digital content, it's not just a device, it's all of these things and an environment that has the infrastructure that can support it long term. Can you adapt curriculum in a way that will be engaging for students in that environment or is the environment such a distraction that it, there's not much you can do about it? Well, we try. You absolutely <laughs> can. I mean, let me be really clear. You can absolutely do it. And I think that's why we have the jobs that right. we have because we believe that. Um, it requires a lot of work. It requires a holistic approach. It requires recognition that technology in and of itself is not going to be the answer. But there is no doubt in this country that when you provide a great, a great educator with great resources, with great tools, in a safe environment, any kid can be successful, and we have to believe that. Okay, well, I want to thank you for oh, thank coming you. here to be with us. Thank you. 
This is Michael Fitzgerald with MIT Sloan Management Review. I want to thank you for joining us for this discussion as well on digital transformation in education, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.